Hello and welcome to this presentation on AI literacy, libraries perspective. Joining us today is Sarah Tabai, the Library Information Literacy Director of the Cross River Campus. Myself, David Drillinger, uh, I'm the Scholarly Communication Librarian also at the Cross River Campus, and Rhonda Altonen, who is the Library Director at the Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine and Pharmacy. So a quick agenda running down what we'll talk about today. First, we'd like to look at AI literacy through the lens of information literacy, the established practices there. Then we'd like to look at how do we teach this? How do we teach AI literacy? And finally, we'd like to talk about how are we already using AI? What's the history here? So today I will discuss how I believe that information literacy serves as a foundation for AI literacy. And although these two sets of skills are not identical, they're closely related. And I want to explore the connection between them here in this presentation. Specifically, I want to emphasize how the skills developed through information literacy can be used to build AI literacy. So before I go any further, let me start with a quick definition of information literacy. There are different information literacy interpretations and versions out there if you Google it. But I use this information literacy in a nutshell uh, graph because I think that explains basically the most important parts of information literacy. And it goes well with what I have to in mind in, in explaining my presentation today. So the very first step would be defining the question. What is the problem that needs to be solved? And then once we know what the question is, we have to search and see where we can find the information. And I will talk about searching strategically in a moment. Um, then evaluating the information for its authenticity and credibility, which is one of the most important steps in information literacy. And then hopefully once we found all the information we need, we put it together with our own previous knowledge to answer the question or solve the problem. And we do all these while following, hopefully, the legal and ethical rules of accessing and using information. AI literacy entails the practical, critical, and ethical use of AI tools in teaching, learning, and everyday life. And we won't delve into the technical aspects of machine learning and AI, which is totally uh, a different side of AI literacy. So formulating the question and understanding the nature and scope of the question is a fundamental information literacy skill. And this very skill is equally vital when interacting with an AI tool. An AI literate person needs to know how to formulate clear prompts by being able to first articulate the problem or the question. And the second part to this would be an AI person also needs to ask themselves if using AI would be even beneficial for the nature and scope of the question. This is especially important as our information needs are changing with AI. When searching strategically for information, it not only involves identifying the best resources, such as the library databases, textbooks, Google Scholar, or eBooks for a particular question, it also means identifying and implementing best search strategies. In the context of academic research, this may require multiple searches using different strategies and search terms and subject headings. Similarly, an AI literate person understands which AI tool is most suitable for a particular need, if at all. Additionally, an AI literate student knows how to construct and implement efficient search strategies to be effectively communicative with AI tools. But like searching a database, this may also require multiple trials and prompts. I see critically evaluating information as the cornerstone of information literacy and AI literacy. In our library classes, we ask our students to validate any information by keeping the five W's in mind. Who created the information and why? Are there any political or advocacy agendas behind this information? What type of information are we looking at and what is it that we need for our project? When was the information produced? Obviously, for health sciences and medical topics, this is extremely important, but it is also the context that matters. These days, especially, we see that a lot of things have been taken out of context for the sake of misleading their audience. And finally, where is the information published or shared? Is it in an academic journal or on social media? Obviously, validating information generated by AI is even of more importance. For me, 
An AI literate person, first of all, needs to have a basic understanding of how large language models and AI tools work. How is the information generated? Where the information, where is the information coming from? And what are the types of sources from which the text is generated? Because ChatGBT, for example, doesn't know the difference between a published article or unpublished article. It doesn't know the difference between a retracted article or one that is coming from a predatory journal. Recognizing bias and misinformation and how to do fact-checking and cross-referencing are important information literacy skills, but they're absolutely translatable to AI literacy, and they're very, very important. After reviewing nearly 150 papers on information literacy skills, we found that one of the biggest challenges for students is to integrate new and old information to accomplish a purpose. And that's what we mean by synthesizing information. So some students were found to have directly copied and pasted content. And we also found in those papers that there's often a lack of clarity in distinguishing, distinguishing between students' words and others. So basically, writing is hard and time consuming, and it is all the more tempting to use ChatGPT and other AI tools for writing, especially for assignments and stuff like that. So an AI literate person, first of all, needs to know, and I think that's very important that we make sure in our classes that our students know that if they use AI tools, it has to be communicated and acknowledged via citation, reference, or an acknowledgement paragraph. Um, it is also important that an AI literate person understands that AI generated content has its own limitations, biases, and can create text that is out of context and contains misinformation, which is stuff that we just um, reviewed in the previous slides. But um, if somebody um, re keeps those in mind, plus thinks that um, basically AI tools should be used only for assistance and they should be su supportive tools, and that they should not let AI replace their thoughts and voices, I think that is very important and helps with um, synthesizing information and writing and creating better products. The last information and literacy skill is understanding the use and access of information legally and ethically. There's so much more to it, but in simple terms, this means that students must avoid plagiarism and copyright infringement. This has always been an important concept, but it's even more relevant in the age of AI. So if a student uses generated text, they must cite and reference it, and in most cases also acknowledge their using of AI, depending on the guidelines set in class. More importantly, since we know that some AI tools can generate wrong information, hallucinating it, an AI literacy student needs to verify the information to make sure they are not citing fiction instead of the correct sources. In other words, an AI literate person knows how to engage with AI tools responsibly and transparently. To empower our students for the future, we have to incorporate AI-related concepts into information literacy teaching. Both AI literacy and information literacy are crucial skill sets for success. AI literacy builds on information literacy skills, therefore enabling our students and ourselves to responsibly engage with AI tools. So the question is, how do we teach this? How do we teach AI literacy? There are many valid ways that you can approach this topic. It's a very deep topic. But I think two very basic fundamental aspects of this is that in order to teach it, you're going to have to use these tools yourself. You're going to have to gain some experience using them. And the other fundamental aspect is once you have that as a basis, you can help students to use them themselves and then reflect on that use as a way of enhancing their critical thinking about AI tools. So the first part of this is, of course, that in order to teach anything, we need to use it. Right? We need to have some experience with it. We have to have some knowledge of it. So the first step here is deciding which tools do you want to gain experience with and which tasks do you want to try using them for, right? That's a really fundamental set of questions. And in order to really get a good answer there, 
you're going to have to start with imagining how your students are going to be using it. How will they use it after graduation? What tasks might they use it for, right? What tasks might AI be integrated into their workflows for, right? Um, and then ask yourself, which AI tools that are currently existing are good for these tasks, right? Um, and there's lots of ways you could find those things. I'll give some examples on the next slide. But once you have that as a starting point, you can then start to design assignments that use AI for these tasks. So here I've broken it down into some of the big major tasks that AI tools are applicable to right now. Um, and I've listed some of the free major AI tools that are relevant to each of these tasks. I think the three big tasks right now that AI tools are useful for is, are probably writing, research, and image generation. Tools like ChatGPT and BARD are quite good at writing, and this will be applicable in the future in terms of you know, helping to write emails, helping to make presentations, all sorts of things. Um, doing research, uh, Perplexity AI, AI has an interesting feature called academic mode um, that lets it link up to a academic database, meaning that when it gives you suggestions for key research or you ask it to, to suggest something or to summarize something, it's able to actually pull that information directly from an academic database. So those things that it's giving you are actually real, right? So uh, this is, of course, relevant to doing literature reviews, um, doing summaries, you know, helping students to understand the research. And then when they later go on and do research themselves, this will be relevant in many ways. And another thing is image generation, right? Um, Adobe Firefly and Bing Image Creator are both, again, free um, to use at this point. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that image generation will probably be relevant in the future. So once you've come up with some tasks that you think will be relevant to your students in the future, you can design some assignments that will use AI tools for those tasks, right? Whether that's writing, analyzing data, summarizing articles, whatever it may be, right? Then you can just have them write about it, discuss it with each other, discuss it with you, discuss it on Canvas, something like that, and ask them to reflect on what were the opportunities? What were the threats, right? What were the limitations of the thing? These things have biases. Did you notice that, right? Did you encounter that? What did they expect originally, right? And how was that surprising when that expectation was not met, right? Was it frustrating? Did you have challenges, right? How did you overcome that, right? How did you think about getting through that? Was it even useful? You know, many times people kind of treat these tools as if they were already superhuman. But there are many ways in which these tools are limited. And reflecting on that is a big part of understanding the ways in which we ourselves are still more capable than these tools. And was it enjoyable, right? Do you want to continue using this tool? Or was it more trouble than it's worth. So I'll break down some example assignments now that you could potentially give to your students as an opportunity to reflect, right? So here's a, an example of an opportunities and threats assignment, right? So you ask them to perform a task. In this case, I'm saying, please draft an essay using the AI tool ChatGPT, right? And then explain what were the opportunities of using this tool and what are the threats, right? So maybe the student says, okay, uh, it really helped with editing. Uh, it helped me to reorganize things very quickly and easily. It helped me to overcome that blank page, that writer's block that comes with having that blank page. Um, you know, but the problem was, you know, the threat is that it's easy to lose your individual voice. I had problems with misinformation. There are many ways that this could be discussed. Um, and this is a really good way of viewing an AI tool in terms of these opportunities and threats. 
Another example assignment would be to focus in more on the interactions between the student and the AI tool. So for any AI tool in which you have a conversation, kind of a back and forth with the AI tool, like ChatGPT, for example, um, you can have students save a transcript showing how they interacted with it, right? And they can use that as a basis for discussing their experience, for reflection, right? They can say, okay, this is what I said, and I was surprised when it gave me something I didn't expect, right? Um, there's a lot that they can work on there in terms of reflecting. And what's more, if you look at the sort of prompts the student uses, right, that could tell you a lot about how they're thinking about a problem. So if you give them an assignment uh, where they have to work through a problem or do a project or something with an AI tool, then seeing how they get the AI tool to do that thing can tell you a lot about, are they thinking about the problem clearly? Did they understand the problem? Did they work through that if they had a misunderstanding, right? There's a lot that you can glean there. Another interesting assignment would be to have students compare search results between a traditional database search uh, of the kind that we teach in our library literacy sessions to using something like ChatGPT or another AI tool to suggest research, suggest key research um, based on a topic, and then compare what you get back, right? Which one had better quantity, better quality, right? How did they compare? How did they contrast? Was there misinformation that the student got from the AI tool, right? Did it suggest papers that don't exist? Did it give them summaries that don't make sense? Um, which one was easier? Which one was faster? Which one was better, right? There are lots of ways that you can compare these things. And, you know, there are merits and demerits to both sides here. Another really important assignment is a fact-checking assignment, right? I think fact-checking skills are really important. They've always been important, but they're even more important nowadays, not just in terms of AI, but in terms of all the information we consume now. So, you know, this is a skill you can really practice if you actually do it, right? So I think a great assignment here is to have an AI generate something like a short essay on a topic with citations. You actually ask for citations and, you know, ask for it to give, uh, you know, 10 citations or something like this, right? Then you have students fact check it, right? This is often more difficult than people realize, right? There's lots of ways that subtle details can be wrong, that little things can, can get in there that are, uh, that are false, even though they appear to be true at first. There's a lot that students can learn from this, and there's a lot that they can reflect on. And this is more broadly applicable to fact-checking in everyday life, I think. And finally, as a really fundamental thing, teaching your students to acknowledge and cite AI tools properly is itself a form of reflection. You know, the students have to be aware, in that case, that that whenever they use an AI tool, they're going to have to tell you where they used it, why they used it, how they used it, everything like that. So every time they use that AI tool, they have to be more aware of it. They have to be able to explain it, right? We have a faculty libguide on this. The faculty libguide explains in more detail when and why and how to cite and acknowledge uh, and the different situations in which those apply. And that is linked in the video description. How are we already using artificial intelligence? We've been using Spellcheck for years and it uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing. On the receiving end of our email, spam filters use AI to either block emails that are suspected as spam or identify email that we want to receive and even sort it into folders if we prefer. Antivirus software uses machine learning as well to protect your email account. Maps will plot out multiple locations, identify restaurants, movie theaters, shopping centers, gas stations, 
for any trips that we're taking. And of course, Netflix is always offering us suggestions based on previous viewing. But where does it fit in libraries? Some academic libraries may say that they lack a foundational knowledge of AI or that they are ill-equipped to speak on the subject. And yet, they've been likely interacting with AI throughout different types of software applications that they support. And at the very least, they have certainly encountered and mastered the art of the search algorithm. All the way back in 1991, Charles Bailey published his article, Intelligent Library Systems, Artificial Intelligence Technology and Library Automation Systems in the Advances in Automation Library and Network Journal. Bailey's paper examined certain key aspects of AI that determine its potential utility as a tool for building library systems. He discusses the barriers that inhibit the development of intelligent library system, and then also suggests possible strategies for making progress in this important area. Another example would be back in 1997, Sightseer, which is now Sightseer X, is a digital library search engine providing free access to more than 5 million scholarly documents. AI techniques are used in many of Sightseer's components, including document classification, deduplication, automatic metadata extraction, author disambiguation, and more. Some academic libraries have been experimenting with chatbox for more than a decade. The Universities of Nebraska-Lincoln, University of California, Irvine, have both built bots, Pixel back in 2010 and Ant Answers back in 2013. While both found success in their bot-to-patron communications, they were limited in their ability to learn from interactions and did fail to provide a viable alternative to human chat interactions. But with the widespread adoption of AI and natural language processing by many bot developers, we are now seeing chatbox become increasingly capable of handling complex information queries. We're even seeing AI being used in law libraries. In 2009, Roy Belest, an academic law librarian and the current director of the law library at St. Thomas University School of Law, first introduced the concept of intelligent agent technology to academic law libraries through a virtual library assistant named Page. His writings also identified possible future uses for artificial intelligence in circulation, cataloging, distance education, and reference. A popular law library resource, LexisNexis, has been applying predictive analytics to various products. Its patent advisor uses data concerning the history of individual patent examiners and how they've handled similar patent applications to predict the likelihood of a particular application being approved. Legislative Outlook also helps users predict a bill's probability of passage. And Lexis Answers, an AI component of Lexis Advance, uses advanced natural language processing to understand a user's question and even suggests questions to better anticipate a research path. Some libraries are using AI to assist their users and researchers in finding resources, and others are providing the space for users to explore AI themselves. In 2018, Stanford University Libraries launched the SUL AI Studio with the stated intention to surface projects where applications of artificial intelligence can assist staff with internal information processing and help make collections more discoverable and analyzable for their researchers. Some of these projects included speech recognition software to transcribe audio cassettes from the collection of the late poet Allen Ginsberg and liberating analog data from oceanic field notebooks into a digital medium that researchers can use. In that same year, the University of Rhode Island opened an AI lab in its main library designed to give students and faculty the opportunity to do research and also to explore the social, ethical, economic, and even artistic implications of these emerging technologies. Radio frequency identification has been used in a wide variety of applications such as highway toll collection, building access control, animal tracking, remote keyless entry for our automobiles, and for most libraries we use it for tracking library materials. There's an RFID tag which has a, which has a microchip that's mounted onto an antenna and then built into a self-adhesive label, which is then put on the back of the book. The antenna transmits information from the microchip to the RFID reader using a standard protocol. Most libraries use this for uh, material control as well as inventory. And medical libraries 
have been providing resources that incorporate AI into their search functionalities, specifically Dynamed and Micromedics. Dynamed, which is an evidence-based point of care tool that's used to facilitate patient safety and care by helping clinicians to answer disease state and drug information questions, use AI to provide this information with less time and with a lot less effort. And Micromedics, which is a pharmacological knowledge base supported by evidence from current literature and sources, uses AI to enhance its integration with electronic health records and clinical decision support systems to assist our providers in improving patient and drug safety. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation today. We hope you found it useful. And remember, there are links in the video description if you want to find anything that's referenced in this recording. Thank you.